I am Brett Bonfield. I'm the library's executive director. <laughs> and thank you for joining us here today. On behalf of the library, I have the pleasure of thanking our guests, Senator Cory Booker, Representative Bonnie Watson Coleman, New Jersey Assemblyman Andrew Zwicker, and Councilwoman Heather Howard. I will introduce our moderator for today's discussion, Councilwoman Howard, in just a moment, but first three brief announcements. Uh, number one, we are at capacity, so the only people who can stand against the walls our library staff or the staff members or the offices of our guests. Uh, two, for everyone's enjoyment, please either silence your cell phone or turn it off. And three, we encourage you to further investigate the ideas that you're about to hear discussed by exploring the expertly curated collection on the library's <laughs> second floor. <laughs> As a member, uh, of the Princeton Council, we can sometimes forget that Heather Howard is also one of our nation's foremost policy experts, especially on health care. She has served as New Jersey's Commissioner of Health and Senior Services and has held senior positions within Senate offices, governor's offices, and at the White House. She is currently a lecturer at Princeton University's Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs and directs two Robert Wood Johnson Foundation funded programs on healthcare policy. Please join me in welcoming this afternoon's moderator. We welcome, welcome. We have, we have an all-star lineup here of terrific speakers, and uh, the, we had so many people sign up that we had an overflow room. So I'm really excited. But before I introduce our speakers, we have some local leaders here whom I want to recognize. We have Councilman Bernie Miller from Princeton. <laughs> Councilwoman Aisha Hamilton from West Windsor. <laughs> and we have a South Brunswick School Board member, Azra Bay. We got three fabulous speakers, and I know we want to hear from them. Um, start, we're going to start with Senator Booker, who is on his second annual Jersey summer road trip, right? And we are his Mercer stop, so we are so excited um, that he would be stopping here at Mercer as he's traveling around the state. Next to him, we have our wonderful Congresswoman Bonnie Watson Coleman, who represents the 12th Congressional District. This is her second term, and in her first term, she was voted the most progressive freshman legislator. Is that right? And then we have a lot of Republicans here, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> and then we have Assemblyman Andrew Zwicker, who is well known to Princeton. He represents the 16th legislative district because he also works here in Princeton. He's a scientist at the Princeton Plasma Physics Labs and a science educator, in addition to representing us so ably in Trenton. So please welcome. So we really appreciate so many of you submitted questions. We got so many great questions that we've gone through and we've grouped them thematically so we can get to as many topics as you wanted to cover. We also have note cards. You either got them when you came in or when you leave. You can fill out a note card with a question or a concern and they will be shared with your representatives. So lots of ways to make your voices heard, but we heard you were interested in issues ranging from healthcare, where we're going to start, to bipartisanship. Can we get back to it? civic engagement, immigration, LGBTQ rights, transportation, voting rights and voting integrity, criminal justice reform, the environment, environmental justice, wow. so many issues. That's, <laughs> hours? Those are the issues about that, hours? That, so that's hours. Interesting for you, right? Those are the questions that came in. But let's start, Senator Booker, and then I want to go to you, to Congressman uh, Watson Coleman. What a week. 
What happened? Where are we in healthcare? Wow. And is it dead or alive? Yeah. Um, so, first of all, I'm really grateful to be here right now. And I will be talking loud for the people in the front row. I still apologize, but I'm really trying to talk loud for the folks in the back. I just wanted you all to know, um, I am just honored to be rolling around for part of this day with Andrews Wicker. I don't know if you all know this, but he is the James Brown of New Jersey politics. Um, uh, the hardest working man uh, that I know. Um, uh, he's, uh, uh, and I'm also, um, this is really one of my, my great heroes in American politics. Nationally, it's probably John Lewis, uh, but uh, on our, in our state, this is one of the amazing trailblazers uh, who has been an ally of mine my entire political career. When she and I sit together in Congressional Black Caucus meetings, uh, she is a light, and I'm just very proud to be here with Bonnie Watson Cole. Don't let the moderator get off so easily. Um, she is one of the amazing public servants uh, in the state of New Jersey. And maybe the best compliment I can give her is when I thought possibly about running for governor, uh, and, and I started imagining what would a cabinet look like. Uh, she was one of the people that if I was gonna go to Trent to work, I wanted her to come with me because she's one of the most smartest, brilliant, and committed people that I know in America, New Jersey politics. So, I, I, wanna, I just wanna do this as cogently as possible because I wanna let uh, Bonnie Watson Coleman speak, but I just want you to know, um, I wanna say thank you first and foremost um, it has been activists from New Jersey, uh, calling, writing, coming down to DC. I've seen my state as best, trying on multiple occasions to defeat um, Republican health care bills. In the House, round one, we won, they, they failed. Round two, they snuck through without even a Congressional Budget Office score, kicked it over to the Senate, with both Congress people who voted on it saying, well, I really hope they fix it for the Senate, with the President of the United States talking about a mean bill and how mean it was, um, and then what did the Senate try to do? Well, they said, well, we can't figure it out here, so we're gonna try to kick it back uh, into the conference committee without us even knowing what's on it. We literally were, were getting ready to vote on a bill that we hadn't seen, and, and the debate actually started on the bill. Ultimately, what they put forward in the last hours was something called a skinny bill, um, which is usually skinny, I, I, I strive for that. Um, <laughs> uh, but, um, but it was, it was another, forgive me for saying it this way, but another god-awful uh, stripping of health care for millions of Americans, driving up costs, doing everything that many Republicans say they don't want to do. They want to make more access, more affordability. But this was yet another version of a craven bill that we were able to, so much credit is being given to John McCain, but please know there's two amazing women Powerful thing. I'm not trying to campaign against any of my colleagues. Crazy reason why we have a almost all male delegation uh, from New Jersey, except for one. Please don't run against me if you're a woman in the room. But um, but but the, those two women stuck strong from the beginning because of Planned Parenthood and, and and rollbacks to Medicaid. So just to get to the point of the question and pass it off to my colleague in the Congress, um, it is not dead. Donald Trump tweeted out today trying to bully and push people to yet try yet again. Yep. Um, so so the, the activism that was shown, the energy, the passion, we cannot rest. It's like the old uh, a song by Sweet Honey in the Rock, uh, Ella's song named after Ella Baker, We Who Believe in Freedom Cannot Rest. So what I'm saying to you all is this is still going and we cannot rest knowing that a bad bill will rear its head. And the last thing I'll warn you about is even without a bill, Donald Trump is actively trying to sabotage the Affordable Care Act. But, but right before he swore his oath of office, on a very difficult day for many of us, right before he did that, Standard & Poor's, not a liberal left-wing think tank, this is the capital center of capitalism in many ways, Standard & Poor's uh, said that the marketplaces were stable and strong and getting stronger. But since he's been in office, He's did everything possible to sabotage Obamacare, including using funding that was supposed to go to advertise for people to enroll to actually do advertising against the law. You literally a federal agency doing advertising against the law of our land. So whether it's cost sharing or other things he's doing to destabilize the market. If you're in New Jersey and I got a call from one of our insurance companies that said, look, 
or raising premiums in the marketplace, which don't affect you if you're getting the 85% of people in New Jersey that are getting subsidies, but it does affect New Jerseyans. And I said, well, what is the majority of this funding, this, this premium increase, what is it about? And he said, it has nothing to do with Obamacare. It has to do with all the insecurity and stability that Donald Trump is driving into the marketplace. So that's the other thing that we have to be vigilant, stopping anything that might rise up, as well as pushing in every way we can to expose the sabotaging being done by Donald Trump and try to make sure that we keep stable of the gains that we made under Barack Obama. Thank you very much. that I am delighted to be here. This feels really good and comfortable, and I appreciate the encouragement I've got as I walk through uh, uh, the audience talking to friends. Um, let me associate with all the good things that my senator said about uh, Andrew and, um, um, I have a niece that Heather. Um, Heather is definitely your rock star, but so is he. And I sometimes have to think of him, I think Rush Gate gave us that gift, you know, so we don't know where he's going to end up, but we know where he's, he's really doing good here. And I am really sure that if we do what we're supposed to do, and it seems like New Jersey just pumped up to do the right thing, we're going to have Phil Murphy as a governor and Sheila Oliver as a lieutenant governor of the state of New Jersey. Phil Murphy knows that he needs a Heather. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't know. He, doesn't know it. he will know it for, for sure. Um, and, and not just in any one, one, one capacity. She can serve in so many different ways. So actually, he didn't leave me much to say. <laughs> um, except that I am firmly convinced that the, the reason that we have uh, this another opportunity to save this situation is because two women stood up Two very courageous women came up. Where no one else really wanted to. Two women just saying, you know, McCain could have stayed home, actually. Because all he did was come to town, uh, give them the opportunity to engage in chaos, chaos, and then give a doggone speech about regular order. I mean, I just think that's contradictory. But you know, who am I? I'm glad he ultimately voted the right way. Um, it is not dead. But the one thing I know is that this government of by and for the people, as long as the people keep showing up the way they're showing up, as long as the people are in their face, and as long as the people in all of the districts, in the Senate districts and the congressional district across this country, are, co are concerned about their health care and tell their representatives what they expect, then we have hope. And this is the only hope we have. The one thing that we know, we know three things. That anything that they put forth is going to increase premiums, decrease um, who can be covered, and then diminish the services that are offered. So we can count on that no matter how they box it. And it's just, it's, it's just really important for us to not grow faint or grow weak, because they have longevity on their side, even though sometimes we think, oh Jesus, what could happen the next day? Because every night we, every night we go to bed, some breaking news comes across the, the television at midnight, and every morning you wake up and there's breaking news, and all the breaking news is really breaking my heart. So every day we think, oh God, is it the end yet? But it isn't, it isn't. There's a process that takes place. So I think the one thing that, um, we need to do is we have to uh, stay alert on many levels. Number one is that we have to continue to be engaged in this fight as it relates to health care. But he's also doing things, dismantling departments, refusing to enforce regulations, changing things through Congressional Review Act, can't get rid of certain laws, but he gets rid of the will and capacity to enforce these laws. And so we we just have to really be an informed and engaged uh, community right now because um, there is a desire to dismantle government or dismantle the uh, administrative, whatever that guy you know I'm talking about <laughs> is referring to. But at the end of the day, it's really dismantling 
uh, our democracy. And as he continues to bring on more and more and more generals and these positions, um, one has to wonder what is his model that he is following. But this is our constitution. We're different. And we have to ensure that we hold people accountable. And so if we have to be out there on the streets, marching down the roads, in the halls of uh, uh, the Senate, in the halls of Congress, if they got to take us out, and when I mean take us out, I mean physically <laughs> <laughs> carry us out, then that is what, you know, that is just what we're going to have to do now because where we stand right now and what we do depends upon the protections for the generations that come after us. And the dismantling that takes place now is going to affect the generations that come after us. And we just, I love my country, we can't allow that. So. We've got so many questions about how can we be engaged, how can we support you. Andrew, what can be done at the state level? This, I mean, we've got folks fighting in Washington, but what, what can be done in Trenton? What? Sure, and that's going to be a common theme that as we talk about various things at the federal level, what can happen in Trenton? What must we do in Trenton? Uh, before I answer that, I have to first thank you, Heather, for moderating and echo what both Bonnie and Corey said about what you bring to healthcare. I will tell you that at the state level, when you look for experts on the various different topics, everybody in this entire state knows that the first person you have to reach out to is Heather Howard. So thank you. Second, can you hear me? Can I speak up more? <laughs> I'll speak loudly. Um, who knew that a simple small town physicist from Princeton could sit next to two giants? I am so incredibly honored. Every single day, I'm going to take off my, my assembly hat and just be a constituent of the two people to my left right now. I am so incredibly honored for what they do for this state every single day. We are so lucky to have In terms of what we can do at the, at the state level, there are many, many things that we talk about different topics that we will do at the state level. level. I will tell you that healthcare is one where the honest answer is we need them and we need you. So if any of these skinny, skinny healthcare bills and health gets through, we're talking about instantaneously about 15,000 New Jerseyans immediately losing healthcare. Within three years, we're talking about over 300,000 New Jerseyans losing healthcare. Five years, it goes up to 500,000 that are going to lose health care. We're talking about billions of dollars of federal aid that come in through the Medicaid expansion that we don't have in the state. This is something that we have to stop at the federal level. But I want to share with you a, a quick story that, that both the Congresswoman and the Senator alluded to. And that was the power that you have, right? They have certain power when they're in the halls of the Senate, when they're in the floor of, of the Congress. But you have the power, and this is really key. So I was down in Washington a few months ago um, talking to basically them uh, and others, <laughs> New Jersey people. This time it was about alternative energy and renewable energy. And I had a chance to talk to Leonard Lentz. Anybody in this room go to any of the protests at the town halls? Raise your hand up high if you did. All right? I had five minutes with Congressman Lentz. And in those five minutes, he told me outright two things. He had already let it leak that he was going to be a no. He was on his way to see the vice president, who was going to twist his arm, and he was going to stay in that hole. And the reason why he said was in part, not completely, but in part, from the town halls, the protests, the letters, the emails, and everything that we are doing. Mm -hmm. So the number one thing that has to happen with this, number one, has got to be you cannot get tired. You cannot slow down. And each and every day, you have got to make sure that your representatives are doing what is best for all New Jerseyans. And if your congressman is already on the right side, then go join just a short distance from here, somewhere else where you can, you can help out. That is by far the number one thing to do. When we move to other pieces, we can go other places, but that's what we have to do for healthcare. You said something about the we as New Jerseyans should know, and I'm very cognizant of this because I think we all feel it. We are a donor state, that's what they call us, because we send a dollar down to Washington and our dollar gets moved around to other states. And we don't get the money we should get back, in my opinion, especially 
on some critical investments. Like this is one of the most economically productive regions on the planet Earth, and we're choking our economic productivity because we're not investing in our infrastructure like we should. While most regions, a dollar invested in infrastructure, gets a dollar to two dollars back in economic growth, we're about four dollars in terms of expansion. And I say all that to say there was a problem. I remember when Heather was in the state house uh, and I was mayor, one of the problems we had was just I, my hospitals were getting crushed in Newark because of charity care costs. Yeah. And, and it was a major problem in our state budget and a major issue. Now, what the, one thing the Affordable Care Act has done that we don't see talked about a lot is it's really driven down our charity care costs as a state because so much of it now is being picked up uh, because of Medicaid, which are our federal dollars coming back to us. So if you have friends in the state who are fiscal conservatives, this is the, the Affordable Care Act is actually a boom for our state because we're getting billions of dollars coming back, helping on the pressures that Andrew has to deal with on a regular basis in terms of our the shambles of our state budget problems. So please understand that this is all related from your state actors and your federal actors. And really, if you're a New Jersey pride person, uh, this is not only about the crisis of healthcare, it's also about the crisis we have in New Jersey about our tax dollars getting invested back into our state. So let's stick with healthcare and, and Planned Parenthood comes up a lot. Also in Washington and transit is another issue that crosses and Bonnie, you've been involved in trying to defend the good work of Planned Parenthood. Can you talk about, you have any predictions on what's going to happen? And then Andrew, this is playing out in trend too. Can you comment? You know, the, the Republican Congress's uh, attitude and Senate towards uh, Planned Parenthood is, is not derived by any logic no. or, um, or science or anything. <laughs> it's just ideologic. And so they're going to try to find as many ways as possible to just rob Planned Parenthood of the resources it needs. Now, Planned Parenthood has been down there in full strength, Plan and uh, Cecile Richards and Planned Parenthood have talked about the fact that Planned Parenthood provides all kinds of medical services to women and to men, and provides no abortions with Medicaid money and, not, and anything of that nature. So this is not about what these people know. This is about what they're ideologically uh, aligned to do for some, for some crazy reason. So I don't know what mechanisms um, they will use, maybe through appropriations and things of that nature. The same thing that Donald Trump is suggesting he may not do in terms of uh, paying for the, 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 the subsidies, you know, which is actually breaking the law. He, the President of the United States is gonna break the law. Um, but they're still going to do everything they can to under, undermine um, uh, Planned Parenthood. And they're trying to, to, to shift the discussion somewhat by saying, well, we want to invest this into the community health centers. And the community health centers are already at capacity. They say they couldn't even handle the additional uh, weight and responsibility of filling in for the people that Planned Parenthood continues to serve. And it's just some, it's, a, it's another element of the fight. What they're going to do, I don't know, because they do their stuff behind closed doors, and then when they come out, it's like you're you're in panic mode already, trying to fight it back. But fighting back is everything is what we've got to continue to do until 2018 when we get a different Congress. <laughs> so, Planned Parenthood in, in New Jersey at the state level is really something that I find very problematic because of the politics behind it. I'll try to explain this briefly. So at the state level, we put aside about seven and a half million dollars uh, of money out of about a $35 billion budget. So this is just a small amount of money, but the impact of that small amount of money is enormous. It leads to health care for thousands of New Jersey women, right? So to lose that has led to closure of of, of clinics. For eight years in a row, the legislature has put in money to fund locally Planned Parenthood. And for eight years in a row, the governor of New Jersey has used his red pen and crossed it right back out. And every year, we look at can we finally, finally override a veto that this governor has done. He has vetoed more bills in his two terms than any governor in the history of New Jersey. 
right? And this is something, again, where if we collectively make our voices heard, we can override this government. He has, as we know, nothing left in terms of politics, right? What it takes is political pressure by us. So there is a bill out right now. We passed it through. He vetoed it. And we are trying to now get enough votes in both houses to override. And we're just a few short. In, in the 16th district, where you have two members of the assembly, you only have one of them who's willing to vote for the override. I'll give you a hint that he's talking to you right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, you've got to get your word out there, right? Because it turns out that the people who need health care the most, women and some men, are the ones who are being denied it. So as we talk about this holistically, in terms of federal and state and local, right? we have to, where we have control, make sure that we get the money and get the services of the people who need it the most. And so we've got to keep that political pressure going still. Senator, you mentioned the lack of investment in infrastructure, and I'd be remiss here if I didn't mention a lot of people in Princeton commute to the city by the train and have, are having experiencing the summer of hell. Any the hope for investments in infrastructure, and you know, there's our answer. Do you have any hope on on the tunnel, on 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 other ways to to really address the infrastructure crisis? So um, we in New Jersey are living in uh, New Jersey transit hell. And um, when I went to Washington, when you all sent me there on October 31st, 2013, my first day in the United States Senate, um, the, the, one of the biggest issues that we've been dealing with, I was able to maneuver on two committees that oversee infrastructure investment, the Commerce Committee and something called uh, um, uh, it, it's the Environment and Public Works Committee, EPW is what we call it. Um, immediately, I, I looked at the situation with the two uh, tunnels that were canceled uh, under the Obama administration, uh, thanks to the decisions of, of our governor, and said that we've got a serious problem because we can't get this done unless we get everybody on the, uh, on the same page and can find some kind of agreement. And at the time, I think we were just coming off a moment where uh, a senator from New York was having a press conference shooting at, metaphorically speaking, at, um, at our governor for the past and all this. And so I basically called a timeout, hosted a summit meeting with all the players uh, in my office. I asked the president then, just so you all know I miss Obama, um, <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I miss her husband too. <laughs> and um, so, President Obama uh, sent his transportation secretary to my office, and there we held a summit meeting with the Governor Christie, and we all said, this is, if we do not do something about this, the two tunnels, which I had taken tours of, and I could see the damage, one of those tunnels would have to be taken out of service to, to, to repair and fix it, which would create a traffic Armageddon, not just in New Jersey, but it would create an Armageddon all up and down the Northeast Corridor. In fact, the damages of infrastructure from the portal bridge to the tunnels themselves, in the 1960s, you could move from Boston to, to Washington, D.C. a half an hour quicker than you could move from it today. We are moving backwards in our infrastructure, and, and the billions of dollars in lost productivity for having to bring one of those tunnels down is, is, un, is unconscionable to me. And so I made it a mission from that summit meeting in my office to get this done. And from that summit meeting, we actually got the governors, uh, uh, Cuomo agreed, Christie agreed, uh, that we would create a plan in which we would split the cost of the tunnels 50-50 between federal and local. I then went to work with, uh, in Washington, I found a Republican partner on the committees I discussed, a Republican from Mississippi, and we actually wrote a rail bill for reinvestment in rail got that incorporated into a very large infrastructure bill, and hey, we were moving. We were clicking down the tra tra tracks. We changed everything from the loan funds to everything. President Obama, in his last year, prioritized this as the number one infrastructure priority in the United States of America. So boom, two senators, or two uh, governors agreed to 50%. We set up a regional development corporation 
the federal government was sitting at the table, everything was working fine, and then something happened on November 8th, I'm not sure if you all know, um, but a new president was elected. And so immediately, I'm not too proud on this, I don't care if you're a Republican, a Democrat, or a Martian, this is, a, this is an urgent American cause, this is not a regional issue, this is a national crisis of, of having the Northeast Corridor in the, in the peril that it is right now. I went right back to work during Secretary Chow's um, uh, confirmation hearings, talked to her about these issues, got her to state on the record her understanding of the importance and the urgency. Invite Secretary Chow to come up and tour the tunnels like I did. Just two weeks ago, met with Secretary Chow uh, 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 with the four regional senators, two in New York, Senator Menendez and I, with Secretary Chow to review what was going on, trying to work for the Trump administration in this period where they're, where they're working on their priorities to get them to understand that this has got to be at the top of their priority list. So where we are is we've made a lot of progress um, up until the Trump administration. Um, uh, in a bipartisan fashion, prioritizing this project, getting funding available, getting coordination between the two states. Uh, but now I'm, I'm a little bit of a holding pattern uh, as Donald Trump decides what he's going to do with money that we put into the budget for this project. So, so that's really where we are. I want you to know, and I said this in a press conference I held uh, earlier um, this month uh, in New York with Chuck Schumer, that, that first of all, if we hadn't canceled this project, if it started when it was supposed to, it would be done next year. And every month that you wait, the cost of the project to taxpayers is going up and up and up. And the danger of the, of the traffic Armageddon that I'm talking about grow greater and greater. There's no fiscal sense, no pragmatic, there's no reason whatsoever we shouldn't do this project now. And so I'm hoping that logic will prevail. Um, um, and I know that a lot of people are gasping because that's not often what you associate with Washington. Uh, but, but this is one of those projects for shame on our country. For shame on our country, you would take your most economically productive region and cripple it because you can't uh, 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 produce uh, the, the, the investment to make in those things. So this has been a project I'm, I was proud of all the way up until the election of Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. In the bipartisan, uh, if you ever told me that my best partner in legislating would be a Republican for Mississippi, I would have disagreed with you, but God bless Ro Roger Wicker and the things we've been able to get passed to invest in this project. And so that's where things stand right now. We're in a bit of a holding pattern as the Trump administration is, is now internally looking at their priorities and they're gonna let us know what kind of um, what kind of uh, infrastructure plan they're going to have. But I'm not just waiting. We're putting a lot of pressure. Uh, we're, we're doing everything we can from uh, Republican and Democratic groups, really everything from uh, uh, chambers of commerce all the way to unions. Everybody right now is pushing uh, on this administration to come out with a priority list that reflects uh, what, the, what the previous administration had. Andrew, do you want to comment? Sure. Um, so. I just want to echo a bunch of things the senator said. Uh, I serve on a joint committee, the Senate and the Assembly, that's looking at New Jersey Transit and Amtrak and our infrastructure. Uh, triggered by the derailment over a year ago that tragically killed a, a young woman. Uh, and since then, has, as we all know now, there have been other derailments. There is this summer of hell. Um, I, too, had a chance to go up and tour through one of the tunnels on a special Amtrak train. And I can tell you that the ties that hold the, the uh, rails together are all rotting. In the tunnel that we went through, you could see the watermark from Sandy where the tunnel flooded. Concrete was peeling away. The uh, switches that we were going through, so I took it from uh, Trenton up to Penn State. Some of the switches were from the 1970s. Uh, the signals are from the 1930s. Oh my God. 1930s. Right? We are talking about decades upon decades of neglect when it comes to the, our infrastructure. On top of that, at the, at the state level, the amount of money that we have put in to New Jersey Transit is decreasing every year. So as fares either go up, right, uh, or stay the same, the amount of money that New Jersey Transit has to then put into their infrastructure repairs is shrinking. So our priorities are wrong. And what people don't understand, and what so many of, uh, you know, uh, of this governor doesn't understand, is that when we invest, 
then we get that money back in the economic productivity. This should be a simple, simple thing to try to do. And we can't. And it's true. We would have a new tunnel in 2018, and we would be fine. Everything would be fine. But we don't. And we don't even have any plans at this point. So what we're doing in this summer of hell is just a band-aid. But when we look at this, and we even start talking about the overhead electrical one which are also, they're sagging, and a lot of issues now are coming from the fact that in the heat, they tend to sag, and they don't make a good connection. Our infrastructure is vital to everything we do. We have got to make it a priority. New Jersey has certain things going for it, right? And one of the things that we have that nobody else has is look where we're located, right? Between Philadelphia and New York, where there's literally billions upon billions of dollars of economic activity every day. Right? And eventually we're going to talk about climate and the environment. Why don't we have a mass transit infrastructure, along with roads and bridges, that will encourage us to not drive, but to easily go to New York or Philadelphia or wherever we may want to go? We have got to prioritize this. We have to do it at the federal level, and we have to do it at the state level. So Stick with that. I'm glad you mentioned there were several questions submitted about climate change and what we could be doing at the federal and state level. So obviously, a lot of people are distraught about pulling out of pet parrots, but what does that mean? What, what can we tell people who are upset about that? What can we do? We'll start with you, but I'm sure you do. And, I, and actually, Senator, on this topic too, I know you've been thinking about the environment really broadly in terms of environmental justice, right? So this the, brings this braids together a couple of issues that are, people are really concerned about. But, so let's, let's start by, by calling it what it is. And you know, now I'm, I will obviously get all fired up. This is, you know, uh, I went to the Trenton March for Science and spoke there, right? And I, had to, and I had to say the following line. I believe in science and I believe in climate change. Who knew that you had to say that in 2018? I believe in science. Science doesn't care what we believe in, right? Of course we believe in science because that's all we have. So an attack on climate change is an attack on science, is an attack on truth, is an attack on evidence. It has been coordinated well before this president. It is being done by special interests in a variety of different places. It is an attack on each and every one of us. That's number one, right? Number two, I read in the newspaper, you know, so there's federal things, but I'll do it at the state, right? I read in the newspaper that California was passing legislation to take them beyond what the Paris Accord was going to do. It's a simple question. If California can do it, why can't we? Right? Yeah. Of course we can. If we have So we have to do a couple of things. We have to, number one, we have to, of course, prioritize it. We have to insist upon it. We have to enter back in to what's called the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, which some of you may know is rich. That says that New Jersey can't do it by itself. Let's work with all of our neighboring states, right? Because it's just like any other movement. It starts with one person, and it builds, or it starts with one state, and it builds. It's a cap and trade program, right? And it turns out New Jersey does pretty well with our carbon emissions. In the time that the governor pulled us out of Reggie in 2011 to today, we've given up hundreds of millions of dollars of revenue that would have come into us as part of a cap and trade program, used in part to build a piece of the new hospital that's just a couple miles away from us. This is insanity that we are not doing these sort of things. It has to start here. We have to look at things like, and I, with my staff, we've been looking at, let's say, uh, revenue neutral carbon taxes. We tax those who produce the carbon dioxide, we give the money back to you. Right? These are things that other states are doing. Canada already does this. New Jersey needs to be a leader. We have to stop being a follower when it comes to this. Right? So this is what our mission has got to be over the next months and into the next years. Because we have got to, and this is around climate, clean air, clean water, the infrastructures that are there, we have got to insist. This is not just about us, this is about our children and our grandchildren, right? And in the end, this is, I'll, I'll end where I started, this is an attack against science itself, right? We must do everything together, collectively, to stop this. Well, I certainly don't disagree with the scientists here on anything. Um, 
But I, I, I need to caution us that there are things that are taking place in Washington that are, are, that are putting us in peril. There are things that they are undoing, regulations that they're undoing, that will um, compromise the clean water, streams, air. Um, there are things that they are doing that are taking away from the innovations of alternative energy and talking crazy about things that are not going to happen, like more coal and things of that nature. Um, so we, we, we do have a responsibility to kind of hold them accountable as far as this is concerned. But I think that with regards to the Paris Accord, there are states and there are cities that are standing up and that have um, signed on to their commitment to the principles of the Paris Accord. And so our, pull, our saying that we're not gonna be a part of it was not something that's just gonna happen abruptly. And it was more of a 30 second sound bite that he gets to make because he's not gonna be there long enough to see this really uh, degrade <laughs> to absolutely nothing. And I honestly believe that because there's a four year pull out, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, of, of the Paris Accord, and there's just no way in the world we're gonna make this uh, mistake again. But there are, there are cities and there are states that can protect us in ways that he may not be interested in and care about, and we have to make sure that our state, our state does this. And I can tell you on something that happened even under this Christie administration, the DEP stood up against FERC and the Penny's pipeline. And that, yeah. And that, that's a very big deal because in Washington, the Congress is trying to turn over all kinds of uh, responsibility and accountability to those who want the pipelines and to, to really do harm to those who will be negatively impacted, whether or not it's their property or the fact that it's compromising uh, certain protected lands or it's going to in interfere with their water and ultimately even with their, possibly with their air. So even under this administration, DEP stood up and rejected the pipeline's uh, latest uh, assault and um, certifications. So that means that states have um, authority here. States can stand up where this president chooses not to on our behalf. And Corey, you've been working on the environment as a civil rights issue, right? Um, yeah, so I, um, I get very upset about environmental issues just because um, what we often don't understand is while climate change is real and it's science and I'm, I'm deeply worried about this and, and fighting about it, um, what we don't understand is that there are environmental nightmares going on all across the state of New Jersey, all across our nation, disproportionately affecting vulnerable communities, disproportionately affecting the poor, disproportionately affecting people of color. And so um, what got me sort of upset there is he had to mention Go and mention Reggie's. Go on and mention regional greenhouse gas agreements. Now, please understand um, when you're mayor of Newark and people talk about Reggie's and policies like that, um, it, it takes me immediately to families that are in crisis. Because you all know that our cities in New Jersey, is, is Newark, for example, has four times the asthma rates than other communities. Upwards of 25% of the children living in Newark have asthma. And something like the Regional Greenhouse Gas Agreement is essential to doing things to help to, to clean our air. And if you sat with families in crisis, the number one reason why kids miss school in the state of New Jersey is asthma in terms of health-related issues. And, and so I get very fired up about the crisis we have. And, and just to continue, um, we know, thanks to research done here at, at Princeton, what happens to children born around Superfund sites. Every state has Superfund sites. Every state has them. Again, they're disproportionately located in poor communities. Uh, I live within a mile of a Superfund site. Well, the, the longitudinal data, science, looking at children born around Superfund sites, they have dramatically higher rates of autism, dramatically higher rates of birth defects. 
and, and, and what, the, what, this, it, it, what people don't understand is that the policymakers who are making these decisions have dramatically changed from caring and concern. We used to actually have, in fact, Mitch McConnell and Ronald Reagan reauthorized the Superfund cleanup process, which was a small tax on polluting industries, petrochemical companies and others, to create funds to clean up Superfund, to clean up these Superfund sites. Every state has them, New Jersey has the most. Those, that, that tax has now lapsed at sunset, and no Republican in this age of Grover Norquist We'll, we'll, we'll put a new tax on. And what has happened to Superfund sites in the United States of America? They've gone up. The threat to our children that exists is unconscionable. I, I visited about a month ago, uh, um, I went through the Black Belt of the South, poor black communities in Alabama and, 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 and Louisiana, and, and, and just sat in packed churches as people came, they didn't come to listen to me because of any, you know, perceived celebrity that I might have, they came because they were just so grateful that a federal official would come listen to their misery and pain, literally, but poor black communities in which tons of coal ash was just dumped in, in landfills in their communities. I, I was in a hog farm country in, in low-lying areas of North Carolina and sat with African-American activists who couldn't open their windows, couldn't put their clothes on lines, in places like Tallahassee, in Uniontown, Alabama, the kind of corporate villainy they're experiencing. Uh, places like, imagine being from a community that everyone knows as Cancer Alley uh, in Louisiana, the strip of the, uh, of the Mississippi River uh, between um, Baton Rouge and, and, and uh, New Orleans, where there's hundreds of times the, of the allowable levels of, of carcinogens, dioxides, you name it, in the air and communities sitting there begging me to do something about the hell they live in. The, the values of their lands and all these communities going so far down. And so I say all this to say that these are communities, when I was in uh, with, with the Huma people, the Native Americans, uh, who not only watching sea level rise because of cl global climate change, but also because petrochemical companies have dredged up the region in, 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 uh, uh, in, uh, around uh, uh, Louisiana to do all their drilling. And so we are in such an environmental crisis that is hurting people we've rendered invisible in our own state. And this is why I get so upset, and this is why when I was talking to Andrew earlier today about the 2017 elections, this year's November elections, and saying to him, and this is, I, I, I'm almost embarrassed, I vocalize this to you, is I'm worried that you know our governor might be so far ahead, people are thinking to themselves, well, why should I go out and vote? We're gonna get a Democratic governor. Well, I'm sorry. You're hearing it from a legislator. I don't know if your community, I know how big of an area you represent, but you have Republicans that serve with you that are voting against common sense environmental issues. And if we can't change the legislature and get more people that will vote in a common way, we're not gonna be able to change a lot of this. Why do we have regional greenhouse gas agreements? Because the state of New Jersey, you wanna blame Christie? I'll tell you why blame, us. In 2008, we had record turnouts in New Jersey. Record turnouts. One year later, in 2009, folk didn't show up to the polls. I'm mayor of Newark, and then people come to me and say, why are they closing our Planned Parenthoods? Why are those Republicans pulling out of regional greenhouse gas agreements? Why are they pulling money out of cities that Trenton had to lay off a third of their police department? People want to blame others.
because we don't show up and vote. And so, and so we have an election in November. I don't want to tell you to vote for, but we have an election in November, and who our state legislature is, if you care about climate change, and you don't know who your state legislatures are, legislators are, then you're not doing enough to fight climate change. And, and the issues that I care about, look, I've got legislation on environmental justice issues that we're about to reveal, empowering local communities to control their destiny. All those folks who might be here from Franklin Township and are worried about gas compressors, I, I totally hear you. We have so much more activity in New Jersey for petrochemical companies. Uh, on pipelines and the like, I, I'm going to be reflecting the concerns of our communities to a very powerful federal agency, FERC. But, but Bonnie knows this. If you can't elect Congress people from our blue state that actually will stand up and fight with me, if you have Congresswoman Bonnie Watson Coleman literally having to fight against people from New Jersey on these issues, then I'm sorry. So, so I know everybody wants to blame and vilify the governor of this state. The governor of the state is a reflection of who came out and voted. And, and so I cannot tell you the urgency. My niece was born, my niece was born a mile from a Superfund site in Newark, an Asian or the largest Superfund site in our country right now going on with the dioxins in the Passaic River. You can't eat things out of the Passaic River because of the kind of corporate villainy because of the hateful hypocrisy of people putting things in Newark that they don't want in their own communities. This is what's going on in America right now, not just here in New Jersey, but I, I wept when I was driving through the South, standing in these churches, listening to people who can't sell their land, can't eat the food from their soil anymore, who, whose only wealth was what the land that was passed down and that's been devastated. Literally, in a town that had that was named after somebody that was suffered from the Tuskegee syphilis experiment. And I had to stand there and say, this is like the Tuskegee syphilis experiment all over again. Because we're taking poor black communities and injecting them with the harshest of chemicals that, that create disease. And so for all of us here who are justice-minded people, who are progressives, please understand, this is not about responding to Donald Trump. I think he is a major problem. But these things went on before Donald Trump. And it necessitates those who benefit from this democracy, not just sitting back and thinking we can enjoy the fruits of this democracy. We've got to be in the fields constantly cultivating uh, so that all of us can benefit uh, uh, from a nation that swears this oath that is not true, but we swear this oath that we're having liberty and justice for all. Well, when it comes to environmental justice, we don't have justice for all. And it's not going to change until we get more engaged and more active. Such a tremendous panel that they've been so generous with their time. I know people have to hit the road, but I want to give Bonnie and Andrew. You want to? It's hard to follow that. But you want to give a close, live closing thoughts? Yeah. Well, I just want to remind us of the whole issue with Flint, Michigan. Everybody thinks that those children out there. Um, yeah, it's our numbers, New Jersey. Is our numbers, numbers are higher. Yeah. Our, our numbers, numbers, are, numbers are, higher. are higher. Yeah, it's just yeah. another illustration of what our families, our poor families, have to deal with. Um, I don't know if we're closing out. I was hoping that we would get to criminal justice reform. We could, why, why, we, why don't we take, I think that that's why don't we take very one, more, one more question from everybody. Okay. Well, I think it's up. Go on, criminal justice reform. Somebody yes. back there. Yes. 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 I know there's a lot of interest in criminal justice reform, so let's hear what you think, what's on the horizon. But, and Bonnie, you did want to, you wanted to take a, a question from the audience, too. No, I mean, she was... She was waving desperately <laughs> back. <laughs> okay, well, Bonnie, sure, you go ahead. Criminal justice. Oh, oh, well, so there are a, there's a lot of discussion about criminal justice, and there are people that you wouldn't expect to be working in that space, you know, uh, articulating that they have an interest in a number of things. For me, there are a couple of core issues that I think uh, have to exist if we're talking about real justice or reform. Number one is we can't, under any circumstances, continue to use private prisons. I think they are. But if you're going to have people in prison, that's a government function, and our purpose should be to rehabilitate, to take them out of society if that's where they need to be, but rehabilitate them, knowing that they've got a 
come back into society. So we need to be talking about what happens while they are taken away, if they're taken away. And we need to make sure that there are certain standards that exist, and there's education, and there's um, uh, uh, personality issues that are addressed, but recognize that 67 to 87 percent of people come back. Um, we need to be looking at sentencing reform. I do not support mandatory minimums. They have not been, they've not been determined to exist. They have been used up against poor people and people of color, and they've not made this society any safer. So when I talk about criminal justice reform, that is not something that is on in my portfolio. And as people, and I can talk to you about this forever and ever, because I'm a co-chair of Black Women and Girls Caucus, and we can talk about the pipeline from school to prison for little black girls and how they're treated differently. Well, the same thing with little black and brown boys, the same thing that they're treated. But we need to be looking at criminal justice reform from our education all the way through our adult experience. And we need to recognize that people are coming back into our communities. We want them to be fully engaged citizens. So they need to be able to vote again. They need to be able to access education and training again because we want them to be able to pay taxes, not have to live off of taxpayers. And so I need you all to pay attention to all the various, um, uh, what do you call those, options and proposals that are coming forth and let us look at them and ask for the evidence that supports the positions in which we're taking. Because I think that this is vital for the for today and for generations to come. So one thing I'll say, this is sort of the same uh, vein as the last point I made. Uh, I, I tell my staff there's sort of two big buckets that we got to focus on every single day. One is economic prosperity, the dignity of work. We need to get to be back to a country where work pays. Uh, where work uh, it has dignity and merit, and that's everything from, uh, you know, in this digitized economy and people making money off of Lyft, TaskRabbit, well, what do you do about pensions? What are you gonna do about uh, benefits? And all those things. There's a lot of crises of work. We've had 20 years of stagnant wages. You're in New Jersey and you feel this. We have a lot of folks who are seeing their costs go, go up and their wages not. And so a lot of what we do is just, what's gonna create economic growth What's going to deal with this problem we have in this country of, of stratification of wealth in this country that is really serious? Uh, poverty has become a trap. How can we be the wealthiest country on the planet Earth and have uh, a dr dramatically have the highest po child poverty rates where 20% of our kids are poor? I travel to other countries and they can't believe that America has, America has this many children living in poverty. Um, so we've got to get back to a country that focuses on the things that make and empower economic growth and opportunity. That includes things like paid family leave. How can we be a state uh, that doesn't have a paid family leave? Uh, so Congo and Afghanistan have paid family leave, <laughs> but the United States of America does. So, that, so I always say that is one bucket I'm working on, it includes infrastructure, growth, growth, opportunity, jobs, and making sure we have a, a sort of justice in the workplace. The second bucket I work on is just fairness issues, and that's why I'm big on environmental justice, that's why I'm big on, 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 on the things that I think create poverty traps. But most people don't understand, everything I just talked to about here, the economic growth period, is affected by the criminal justice system. We would actually have 20% less poverty in America if we had incarceration rates the same as our industrial peers. Because we take poor people and disproportionately criminalize them. In fact, people are stuck in prison just because they're poor. There are people sitting in Rikers Island right now have waited months, six months, a year, haven't even gotten a trial yet because they can't afford to get themselves out for minor crimes. And so we have this country that, that, that makes you, attacks you if you're poor, criminalizes you, as, as, as a great uh, American Brian Stevenson says, we have a justice system that treats you better if you're rich and guilty than poor and innocent. And then when you get out for doing things that two of the last three presidents have been doing, we then say to you, well, you still are going to be poor than even when you went in because we're not going to let you get a job. We're not going to let you get business licenses. In New Jersey, there's so many business licenses you can't get if you, if you have a felony conviction for a nonviolent drug offense. We're not going to let you uh, uh, get food stamps, Pell Grants, public housing. 
We're going to make your life so difficult economically that you often feel like you have no choice but to go back into the underground economy. In addition to that, as we just talked about infrastructure and how it's important for job growth, economic growth, think about this, everybody. We are in this country, and I've had people talk to me about this overseas in an astonished way. Literally, they're bragging. Our trains are faster than the United States of America. Our, our, our ports are more efficient than you all in America. Uh, your, our roads and bridges are beautiful and nicer than yours in America. But you guys have the best infrastructure in one area that we don't want to have the best infrastructure in. Prisons. We, the, between the time I was in law school to the time I was mayor of the city of Newark, we were building a new prison every 10 days, pouring trillions of dollars, not building those tunnels, but in building prisons all over this country. And yeah, it really does affect political power too. Remember, there are red counties where census counts their prison population, often coming from cities and blue counties. They count their prison populations. And when you come out, as, as the Congresswoman said, Florida is our swing state. Did you all know that one in every five black people in Florida cannot vote because of felony disenfranchisement. And remember, there's no difference between blacks and whites for using drugs or dealing drugs. But blacks are about four times more likely to be arrested for that and then lose their voting rights. And so this is the system that we live in. But let me give you one more thing, because we got all of us should thank my job amongst all the things I'm doing. I have another job, which is to get folk woke, to wake people up to the injustices in our, in our country. And so, I don't know if you know, everything I talked about, uh, Congressman just talked about this, but everything I talked about, our system that preys on the poor, that preys on the minorities, that preys on the mentally ill, I want you to understand that our, our justice system preys on another group, happens to be the majority of our country, it preys on women. Right. How's it prey on women? Well, the, the, the incarceration rates for women are growing 50% faster than the incarceration rates for men. One out of every three incarcerated women on the planet Earth are in the United States of America, the land of the free. We have a third of all the planet's incarcerated women. And guess what, everybody? They're even disproportionately more than men, they are non-violent offenders. And guess what else? They are overwhelmingly survivors of sexual trauma. 86% have, 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 are, are survivors of rape, molestation, of sexual violence. I, w I was just in a Danbury federal pr prison, and I asked the warden as we were walking in, how many of these women are, are survivors of sexual trauma? And, and this strong African-American woman leader, warden looks at me with pain, and she says about 95% of my women. And then we put them in environments, this is going on in our name, we are, we are, we are complicit in this. Because remember, when you arrest people, when you try them, it's the people versus. In our prisons right now, you have women who are pregnant, who are being shackled while giving birth, being shoved into solitary confinement. The majority of those women are parents of minor children, and they have to make this hard. Imagine this moment in American history where we are right now, that we're so savage, that we make women have to make terrible decisions. Do I buy? with my little bit of dollars that I have, sanitary products. Do I buy quality tampons or pads or do I call my children? Because we charge usury, we don't provide adequate sanitary products and we charge usury rates for phone calls. So I could give a lecture an hour long plus about the injustice that's happening right now in the United States of America in our criminal justice system. But I'd be wrong if I didn't end with a moment of hope. Because none of this darkness that I've described from economic injustice, environmental injustice, uh, a criminal justice, and criminal injustice in our system, none of these problems are bigger than we are. As Bill Clinton has said, nothing that's wrong with America can't be solved with what's right with America. We are a nation that has seen dark, dark periods in our country's history, and we found ways to overcome things that were unimaginable. And so I have a tremendous sense of hope. And remember, hope doesn't exist in the abstract. abstract. Hope has got to be a response to despair. Hope has got to be the active conviction that despair won't have the last word. All those people who are throwing up their arms about Donald Trump, tell them don't throw up your arms, roll up your sleeves. Get to work. Because we have overcome the world. So, so this is the last, this is the last
I ask you, I hope that everybody can tell folks, because I really do uh, uh, have a lot of faith, a lot of hope, and it's driven by incredible state leaders uh, like Andrew, incredible congresswomen. I tell you, I, when I go to our CBC meetings, sometimes I don't care what we're talking, I'm just going for the fellowship. <laughs> um, and, and, and I just want to tell you all, just, just please understand, our generation of Americans, uh, uh, we're not called to, to, do, to march on freedom rides. We're not called to, to, to storm beaches in Normandy. We weren't there at Selma or Stonewall uh, or weren't there at, at Seneca Falls. But more than ever, this is the moral moment of our country right now. And generations later will ask us, where were you when they tried to, to, to take transgendered soldiers serving on the front line and pull them out of the military? Where were you when they tried to build pipelines underneath the Raritan Bay? Where were you when, when there were Superfund sites in the state of New Jersey, orphan sites waiting to be cleaned up, poisoning people and communities? Where were you when they tried to ban Muslims uh, uh, from, this, from, the, from the United States, of, uh, from entering the United States of America? This is gonna be the question that our children and our grandchildren are gonna ask us. And, and we have to got, we've got to give the best measure of our patriotism, of our commitment to the country's principles in this week, in the month, in the year, or God forbid, until 2020. So I just want to thank you all for showing that commitment today by showing up. And I just want to say, please, we've got to fight on. We've got to fight for our nation. Thank you again for all you do on behalf of us. This so gives thank us you. Thank you. Thank you.